Rub up your engines! Okay, we got a common problem here. The brake pedal sinks too much. The master cylinder had been replaced. So the first thing we're gonna do is look for any possible leaks. So I'll jack it up in the air and check for leaks at each wheel. Now we got it up in here, we can just turn the wheel. We don't have to take the wheel off. That's too much work and I'm lazy. We'll crawl under and take a look. Now as we can see here, it's dry as a bone. The hose isn't leaking. I'll check the other side. Pretty much the same thing. It's all dry as a bone. There's no leaks. So it's off to the back of the car. And we'll check the back brakes. It's dry as a bone back on this side. Then we go to the other side. It's also dry as a bone. There's nothing leaking on the brake system. And this is an old style. It's got drum brakes in the back. When they leak, what leaks is the top. The little wheel cylinder leaks. But it's dry as a bone. Why is the pedal going low? Well, perhaps you got a bad master cylinder, but I kind of doubt that because the mechanic put a master cylinder on, I said, well, maybe that one's bad. They put another one and it did the same thing. So odds are the master cylinder's okay, but there could easily be air in the system. Now, as you can see, here's the master cylinder all new, but this car also has anti-lock brakes right here. Unless you got a fancy computer like I have, you can't bleed the ABS system. Ah, but I got the machine, so let's hook it up. We got the old fancy scan tool, we'll plug it in. And turn it on. Read the VIN code, 2012 Camry without a smart key. Now we're in the brake bleed. Air bleeding. Okay, the first thing it tells us to do is the right front, left front, right rear, left rear. Then hold the pedal down, then with it down, loosen the bleeder plug. So you pump the brake a few times. Then hold it down. Then under here we have the wrench on the blader screw. Open it up. Out comes fluid and then you tighten it up. Uh, uh. Now it's nice and tight. Okay, hold it down. Then we'll open it again. And there's fluid coming out, but there's no air. Well, no air came out there, so we got to repeat the process. Right rear and left rear. But unfortunately, after doing that, still no air came out. So, then here we go again. This one's taking more time. Counting down from 20 seconds. And as you can see, this is pretty time consuming. Repeat steps one through four, a minimum of 10 times. Now it's a little bit better, but I noticed one thing. That spins really free, so I'm gonna check the drum brakes. And we'll get the drum off. Still lots of shoe, it's thick. But a lot of times, they won't get tight. They won't tighten up right. So, right here's the adjuster screw. We'll try tightening it up a little. Hear it clicking? You can see it slid on too easy and it still spins. So it needs to be tightened even more. Pump the brakes now and see what happens. You can hear it dragging. Now that's just the right tightness. Freely spinning, it's tight enough. See, it doesn't spin, it's dragging. You want a little drag. The wheel back on and do the other side. Now we're on the other side of the car and you can see this spins too free too. So we're going to tighten this one up. Off comes the wheel. Whee! Off comes the drum. A few whacks. Off it slides. And it's pretty much the same. It's got plenty of shoe left, but we're gonna tighten it up a little. You can hear it click as it tightens up. That's tightening it up. And we're pumping the brake to equalize the pressure. Okay. And now we'll see if it spins. You can see it's got a little drag, which is exactly what we want. What happens is, if the brakes aren't adjusted tight enough, they're slack. So it's got to go this far before it grabs. So we've adjusted them. As they age, they don't adjust like they should. Years ago when I was a young mechanic, most cars had mechanical brakes that you had to get a wrench on the outside and you had to adjust every so many thousands of miles to compensate for wear. These have automatic adjusters, but as they wear, they do wear out. Now we got a non-sinking brake pedal and you learn something. It isn't always the computers that mess up. Sometimes you can fix these things with a screwdriver and a hammer because the back brakes were just too loose and needed a little tightening up. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Well, I can't resist this one. I started reading Bill Gates' How to Avoid a Climate Disaster book. And you know, he thought we should all drive electric cars. He went out and bought an electric Porsche Taycan. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I think uh, he should win the award for biggest hypocrite of the year. He's got a fleet of gasoline cars. He also has a fleet of private jet planes, which of course use fuel like no tomorrow. He also owns a fleet of helicopters. And if you look at the overall picture, he has a giant mansion. And that mansion has like half a redwood forest worth of redwood trees to build it. And even, believe it or not, he imports 
sand from the Caribbean every year to put around his lake. <laughs> he doesn't like the local sand. He's got to bring sand the whole way from the Caribbean there, right? Talk about hypocrisy. He tells everybody, we should drive electric cars. We should eat synthetically grown beef while he's eating regular hamburgers. He owns stock in Exxon. He owns stock in all kinds of companies that do all kinds of pollution. He's actually, from what I've read, the biggest landowner in the United States of farmland. Bill the Farmer, right? Of which mainly corn and soybean is grown, which of course is fed to the cows, which he says we shouldn't be eating. Here we have Bill, who's the king of do as I say, not as I do. Maybe he'll try to amend his ways. Maybe he'll get rid of his gas cars. I kind of doubt it. It just amazes me the hypocrisy of these people who have it all, and then they tell people how they should go about doing things. It reminds me of the Michael Moore movie that everybody got mad on. It was on YouTube, where we're showing how the Green Party wasn't all that green. Well, here we go with Bill and his one of the most polluted looting mans in the world as far as flying around in airplanes just said he's he was rated number one as the guy that burns the most fuel by himself flying around the world right these guys have brass balls to write books like this to say you know how to save the world when it's exactly the opposite of what they've done themselves and want us to you know take the crumbs that fall off the table. Now, I'm sure a guy like Bill Gates, he's surrounded by yes men his whole life because they want to get the crumbs that fall off his table as they follow him around. And the politicians who fawn over anyone that says they're green and they don't bother doing a little research of how the guy actually lives. So <laughs> if you want to follow somebody as do as I say and not as I do, I guess you could follow Bill, you know, but I'm not going to listen to his ideas unless he starts implementing himself in his own life. Ray Charter 98 says, I have a 98 Toyota Camry, clean the throttle body, and when it's ice cold, it idles too low. All right, well, if it didn't do that before you cleaned it, sometimes it can take a week of driving for it to equilibrate itself back. So give it at least a week. Now, if after a week it doesn't, then unfortunately you might have damaged something because when it's cold outside, it's supposed to idle a little bit higher than normal. Then as it warms up, it goes down. And you could have damaged one of the sensors in there. If you ever clean the throttle or anything, what you want to do is disconnect the throttle from the vehicle or disconnect all the electronics from the throttle so it's no longer electrically connected. Clean it, then let it dry for an hour or two, air dry, and then put it back together and start it. You don't want to have power to it when you're cleaning it because you could short something out. But like I said, give it a week or so of driving. If it goes back to normal, it'll fix itself. If not, you've probably damaged one of the sensors in the throttle. Check this out. This is a 90s Dodge Caravan off-road minivan that almost made it to the production line. Michael Santoro worked at Chrysler and he had this idea to make an off-road caravan. Now of course they didn't actually make it and that would be rather hilarious when you think about it because caravans had enough problem going down the road without braking than going off-road and then braking. The old joke is why does a Dodge Caravan hold eight people and the answer is so that seven of them get out and push it while the eighth guy steers it to the nearest gas station to get it fixed. He claims that the Dodge dealers loved it and all kinds of people thought it was interesting, but when the Jeep dealer saw it, they raised the stink saying it will cut into their sales of Jeeps. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ask me, I think it's a good thing they did not make the off-road caravan because then there would have been many people not just stranded on-road with caravans, but stranded off-road with them too. Well, it's a fascinating new engine out there. It's called the Rotary X engine, and it's a revolution in thermodynamics. It's a combination of about every engine out there. It's a combination of a normal auto cycle, four-stroke. It's a combination of a diesel engine. It's even a combination of a backwards engineered Wankel engine. Now, the Army is actually using it for some stuff, for generating purposes, because they put out a lot of power for very little weight. The Army's using it to power the electronics of one of their howitzer systems. And here's the interesting thing. It's an M777 howitzer. They have to have a trailer to pull the generator to use now. With this revolutionary engine, it only weighs 41 pounds and is about the size of a gaming PC. So it's much smaller and lighter weight. Now, it's kind of like an inside out Wankel engine. It's a really crazy design. Where the Wankel has a triangular rotor and an oval housing, the Rotor X has an oval rotor and a triangular housing. And in each each of the three housing chambers, the Rotary X intake and exhaust ports built into the rotor itself. And for every revolution, there's three combustion events, just like in a normal engine. 
So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.